So it is a real honor to actually introduce uh, the legend and icon of uh, the heart rhythm world, Dr. Albert Waldo. Uh, I think a, a lot of us who are here, who have been in the field for much longer than me, Ria, or Madhu, any of us, have really uh, had the, the opportunity of, of working with Dr. Waldo, and, and he's one of the true thought leaders who really steered the electrophysiology in the direction that uh, we are in today. With that, I would like to say a few things about Dr. Waldo's accomplishments. Uh, Dr. Albert L. Waldo, MD, is the Walter H. Pritchard Professor of Cardiology, Professor of Medicine, Professor of Biomedical Engineering at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, Cleveland, Ohio. He is also the Associate Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine for Academic Affairs at University Hospitals Case Medical Center. Dr. Waldo received his MD from the State University of New York College of Medicine, downstate, and completed his postdoctoral fellowships in cardiology and cardiac electrophysiology at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York City. He is a founding member and past president of the North American Society of Pacing and Electrophysiology, NASP, which is currently called the Heart Rhythm Society. And he has served as president of the Cardiac Electrophysiology Society and the Ohio chapter of the American College of Cardiology. He's a fellow of the ACC, the American Heart Association, American College of Physicians, HRS, ACP, and he's a member of several distinguished organizations, including the American Society of Clinical Investigations and the American Physiologic Society, among others. Dr. Waldo's research in the field of cardiac arrhythmia is well known, and he has more than 700 publications. And in 1997, one of his articles, the demonstration of the mechanism of the transient entrainment of ventricular tachycardia with rapid atrial pacing, was selected by ACC as one of the 14 historical articles that influenced the direction of cardiology during its 50th anniversary commemoration. He has participated in numerous clinical trials, including being the head of steering committees, executive committees, planning committees, data safety monitoring boards, and as principal investigator. He received the Distinguished Scientist Award from NASP in 1997, and in 2009, he received the Distinguished Scientist Award from the ACC. He has received both the William Dock Master Teacher Award in Medicine and the Distinguished Alumni Achievement Award from his medical school, an award for achievements in clinical and experimental cardiology. He has a fantastic long list of awards, and I'm like totally lost here where to start. <laughs> he also received an outstanding achievement award from the European Cardiac Arrhythmia Society in 2006, the first Founders Lectureship Award from HRS in 2007, the Michel Miroski Award of Excellence in Field of Clinical Cardiology and Electrophysiology in 2007, the University Hospitals Case Medical Center Society of 1866 Distinguished Physician Award in 2012. He also received the Pioneer in Cardiac Pacing and Electrophysiology Award from Heart Rhythm Society in 2013. Dr. Waldo's extensive public service has included committee memberships on the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute's Cardiovascular A and B study sections, the American Medical Association's Diagnostic and Therapeutic Technology Assessments Program, and numerous committees of the ACC, AHA, HRS, NASP. The consultant to the circulatory system devices panel of the Medical Devices Advisory Committee of the FDA, and the Electrical Signaling, Ion Transport, and Arrhythmia Study Section of the NIH, NHLBI, and the membership on the editorial boards of the most revered peer-reviewed journals in the field, including Circulation, JSCC, American Journal of Cardiology, PACE, JCE, JICE, Clinical Cardiology, and the Audio Journals, ACC Axel, and NASPET. With this, it's our honor to present Dr. Waldo the Pioneers in Electrophysiology Award on behalf of University of Kansas Medical Center. Dr. Waldo. So we'll take a picture with the, with the group. I think if Dr. Dendy is in the auditorium, please. Okay, so we'll do it in, during the break. Uh, 
Oh, Dr. Lacquity, thank you. I'll come next week, too, if you... <laughs> Uh, so it's a, my, my uh, pleasure and honor to be here to receive this award and to participate in this symposium. Um, Dr. Lacaretti gave me the choice of anything I wanted to talk about. And I, I suggested that it might be fun to talk about something a little different, not science per se, but about science, and very relevant to our field of cardiac electrophysiology. And I, I chose the history of cardioversion and I'll show you why in a moment. So um, in, uh, in 2008, uh, the editor of Circulation invited me to write um, an article on the history of version, past, present, and future. And I thought it'd be a lot of fun. And I asked one of my colleagues, Dr. Ivan Chukulov, a junior faculty with me, I thought it would be great to give him an opportunity to have a first authored circulation paper, and I'd be the senior author. And I had no idea what we were getting ourselves in for, because I thought this was something very straightforward and very nice, but very straightforward. And uh, it turned out to be something much, much more than that. In fact, it occupied us for th over three months of almost nonstop. The circulation gave us 50% more pages uh, for the article because of what we found. And that's part of why I want to share it with you because it's not only about um, the importance of cardioversion and, and what it's brought to medicine, but about the people particularly and the character of the people, uh, mostly very good, but some of it you'll see not so good. And, um, and, and, and it's about science, about what we do and the pursuit of it and, and um, character counts. And you'll see that in, in this, I think. So um, I just start from the beginning. This is I want to race through this very quickly, uh, but it really started with the, with the Leiden jar in 1745. We were able to store energy, and then the first point uh, really was a fellow named Abelsgard, who in 1775 was using electricity on hens and noticed that when he moved the energy around, he made atrial he made uh, the the hen collapse and die. But he was able to revive the hen if he it was did it around the chest, around the heart. Uh, had no idea what he was doing, but he did report it. Of course, Galvani and the famous experiments with uh, the, the uh, stimulating the frog's leg the, during an electrical storm, and people began to realize that electricity had something to do with how the body functioned. Uh, one of the very first reports of, of resuscitation was reported by a fellow named Kite, uh, who didn't do it, but he was in, uh, but reported in the UK of a four-year-old girl who had collapsed and, um, and was resuscitated by a shock to the chest delivered through a Leiden jar. Um, but the, we began to get into the era of science with Ludwig and Hoffa, who were playing with electricity, um, literally playing with electricity with the open chest, and were able to show that with AC uh, shock to the heart, they, they made the heart quiver. They didn't call it fibrillation, but it was the first description. And it was Volpian, a, neuro, a neurologist in France, coined the term fibrillation, he was the first to suggest, in fact, that the heart was responsible for originating and sustaining the rhythm. Until then, it was thought that it was all the nerves that had done it. Then we get to John McWilliams, a Scotsman, who um, uh, in the uh, 19th century was the first to suggest that ventricular fibrillation and not cardiac standstill was the mechanism of sudden death in humans. And then we begin to get to the seminal work uh, that came from Prevost and Batelli in Geneva, who showed that a amount of elect electricity delivered across the chest can induce ventricular fibrillation. So they did it systematically. But there was a footnote to this article that said, a larger electrical shock fully restored sinus rhythm. This was disregarded by most, and even uh, uh, Carl Wiggers who from my university, who was very, very famous for what he did in ventricular fibrillation, uh, remarked at the time that it wasn't worth thinking about because they, they, were very, they were very, very, very skeptical. But what I want to show you is that what happened here is that with Volpian um, described uh, uh, fibrillation, I mean, who just said that fibrillation was the cause, uh, Jean-Louis Prevost, Prevost and Patelli in Geneva, but Prevost was a pupil of Volpian, and that's part of the reason why he was studying this in Geneva. But in Geneva, there was a, a woman named Lena Stern. She was Russian, and she was a graduate student with with Prevost and Batelli, and uh, 
she did uh, began to do work on uh, on resuscitation, including cardioversion, and uh, stayed on uh, uh, to be on faculty. Except she couldn't advance. She was Jewish, and there was a lot of anti-Semitism. You see a lot of that in this about character, and so uh, she accepted. And she was Russian, so she accepted an invitation from the Russian government to head one of their physiology institutes. And a fellow named Naum Gurovich was a, a, a physician who graduated, was practicing in rural Russia, decided he wanted to do something more with his life, and he came to Lena Stern, and she put him in charge of uh, what we now call cardioversion, of, uh, of ventricular fibrillation. And Gurovich was seminally involved, and in fact, you'll see in a little bit that the Russians were literally decades ahead of us. It was unknown in the West, shameful. And, and, um, and uh, two other things happened very interesting. Lena Stern was the protector of Naum Gorovich. They were both Jewish, by the by. And Lena Stern was wound up being accused in the, by Stalin in the uh, 50s in the so-called Jewish doctor's plot. And uh, all those doctors were killed. She was the only one who survived. She was banned to some of the one of the far western provinces of the USSR. But, and Stalin kept her alive because she was with resuscitation and he thought, he said, he thought maybe I would need her one day. So she survived. And Gurevich, as you'll see in a moment, uh, was so good. But part of the reason stuff didn't get out is he was Jewish. And there was great, um, great um, prejudice about that. And in fact, the, the commentator told them, and he, he was protected by another guy when, when Stern left, a guy named Nagovsky in another, in another of the institutes in Russia. And he was ordered to fire Gurevich, and he did, but hired him the next day. And that happened over a long period of time. But Gurevich was absolutely, you'll see what a remarkable person he was and what he did decades ahead of us. And then we finally uh, get to the United States, and this is also uh, brought by a fellow named Brew Berkowitz. I bet most of you don't even know who he is. Some of you in the pacemaker field might. Um, he was a survivor of the Holocaust. As a teenager, he was in, he was in one of the camps, and uh, his family perished, but he, he managed to get through the war and um, well, got educated uh, in, in Europe, in France, in fact, then went to Israel, for, but he... He got very interested in, in cardi, what we now call cardioversion. He couldn't do it in Israel and came to the States, and you'll see what happened. He was absolutely seminally involved and introduced Bernard Lowne, who became famous for this, and you'll see. Um, uh, I'll let the story speak for itself, but Bernard Lowne, who, who has lots of accolades, and, and was, he didn't receive the Nobel Prize, but he, he, uh, he accepted the Nobel Prize, along with the Russian, for the um, physicians against nuclear war. He didn't win the Nobel Prize for Science, but uh, was a very, very important person in the history of cardioversion and, and intensive care units and the like, but you'll see what comes. So it's a very, very interesting story. So let's go back now and, and work in the first half of the 20th century. So in the United States, the work was done at Hopkins because as electricity progressed, the cons Consolidated Edison Company noticed they were having lots of accidents. People were being electrocuted. It's not a happy thing, and they wanted to find out about it. So um, they, uh, uh, they went to Hopkins, and Co uh, Kovenhoven, who was uh, an electrical engineer, and Langworthy and Hooker, who were physicians, studied this. Um, they, they studied both AC and DC current, and they thought that AC current uh, was, uh, uh, was very effective. Um, but what I want to show you is that when they, when they studied both AC and DC current, uh, sh um, shocks, uh, applying shocks to uh, animals and concluded that AC shock was more effective in terminating ventricular fibrillation. But in 1933, Johns Hopkins Group succeeded in terminating VF in a dog when they accidentally applied a second shock and hence the term countershock. That's where that term comes from. But not much more came from that. Um, and then we have uh, Wiggers, uh, my university, who uh, worked on mechanisms of fibrillation and defibrillation and described the induction of ventricular fibrillation through the concept of the vulnerable period, which became, becomes very, very important for understanding how we got to cardioversion. And he was also a proponent of defibrillation, although he did not believe uh, uh, in, uh, in, trans, uh, in transthoracic cardioversion. He, he had believed he had to open the chest and apply it directly. I don't know why that's hidden on the bottom, but for me to see, you can really see that there's a... I can't see the bottom line here. Okay, anyway, so then we get to Claude Beck, who was the first person, the first uh, who 
one of the first known defibrillation, of ventricular fibrillation in a human. He was at my hospital, then called University Hospitals of Cleveland, and he knew of the work of Carl Wiggers. In fact, they had worked together. And he was operating on a you know, a boy, and during the closure of the wound, the pulse stopped upon which the wound was reopened and cardiac massage was performed. That was what was advocated by Wiggers at the time, uh, to, uh, to do cardiac massage. And for the next five minutes, he did it while they went and searched for Wiggers' defibrillator. And an ECG confirmed VF, and seeing no other option, Beck delivered a single shock. They actually plugged into the socket on the, in, in the electrical socket in the operating room, and seeing, uh, so Beck delivered a single shock, but it failed to defibrillate the VF, so he then gave intracardiac procainamide and shocked again, and it was successful. But now we get to the Soviet Union. So this was Lena Stern, we talked about her already, from the Institute of Physiology at the Second Medical University in Moscow, a, a former trainee with a Provost and Patelli, and, uh, and she assigned the study of arrhythmogenesis and defibrillation to a PhD uh, student, Pam Gurbich, who was already a physician. And um, so Gurbich uh, became a key figure and made fundamental discoveries in the fields of fibrillation and defibrillation. And by the way, part of the reason that we found this out is my colleague Ivan Chakulov was born in Macedonia and read Cyrillic and understood Russian. He's been in the United States now since the age 18. So, um, and uh, uh, um, when he went to Google and looked up version, there was all this stuff in Cyrillic. And, he, and that's part of how we learned about it. And that's why we also invited Igor Efimov. Some of you know Igor, who was uh, uh, an emigre from Russia, who's now an Amer American citizen. And he was at Case Western Reserve for a long time, at, first at the Cleveland Clinic, Case Western Reserve, and then now in Wash U. <clears throat> But uh, we were able to learn a lot about this because people were able to read Russian, and we actually got in touch with Gurevich's laboratory assistant who was still alive. So Gurevich became a key figure and made fundamental discoveries. Um, in 1939, 1939, uh, in their classical work, Gurevich and Yuniev proposed using a single discharge from a capacitor to defibrillate ventricular fibrillation, thus eff effectively introducing T shock for defibrillation purposes. Until then, an AC shock was, the fa was favored and was being developed as the most effective way to defibrillate VF. A lot of that was from the work in Hopkins, even. Parenthetically, in the West, AC shock continued to be used exclusively until the early 1960s. In his doctoral research from 33 to 39, Gurevich found that an AC shock at a frequency of 500 hertz could not be tolerated and, in fact, leads to VF. But he also showed that a single discharge from a capacitor with a DC shock terminated VF. Another advantage of a DC shock was that a large amount of energy could be delivered in a relatively short period. Then in the 1940s, uh, combining his studies with Wiggers, the wiggers wagria model of defibrillation that was based on using, based on biphase to defibrillation waveform, he, he was, how many decades, that's almost three ahead of it in the states uh, beginning to look at biphasic waveforms. So uh, he, uh, he first reported using rounded biphasic waveforms used by a capacitor and an and, uh, and inductor for defibrillation as early as 1939, although at that time he was unaware of the superiority of this waveform over the monophasic waveform. More important, these advances allowed Gurevich to propose his excitatory theory of defibrillation suggested that direct excitation of the myocardium is what prevents further propagation of fibrillatory waves without preventing resumption of normal sinus rhythm. He also introduced the mother reentrant circuit concept uh, as a foundation of the development and sustaining sustainability of ventricular fibrillation. In 1952, Gurevich designed the first commercially available transthoracic DC defibrillator in the world. The application of this device was described in great detail in the Soviet Ministry of Health Resuscitation Guidelines published in 52. The guidelines required every operating room of a, of a major hospital to have a defibrillator. This first DC defibrillator uh, we, uh, we used a monophasic waveform, which 10 years later became known as the Lown waveform. So, again, miles and miles ahead of us. In 1970, Gurevich introduced the first biphasic transthoracic defibrillator, which became the standard in the Soviet Union uh, uh, since that time and preceding uh, Western uh, analogs by at least two decades. And part of this, again, uh, why didn't this get out? 
why didn't the West know about it? In fact, I'll bet very few of you in this audience even know about it, unless you read our article in, in circulation a few years ago. Uh, and a lot of this had to do with the fact that the Russians claimed they were first in everything and there was a lot of skepticism. Um, but the other thing was that Gurevich kept his head down because he was Jewish and they were trying to fire him all the time and uh, he had to even be careful. Even tra He only tra traveled to the West rarely and uh, so really nobody knew about this and that was remarkable. Interestingly enough, Hugh Humphrey in one of his trips when he was, uh, before he ran for president uh, in 1960, he was 58, he visited the laboratory. Uh, uh, Lena Stern was no longer there and Novosky was it was Novosky who was the protector of Gurevich, and he met Gurevich, saw what he was doing, came back all excited about it, published it in the congressional record, didn't get any further. Interesting. So now this is something else interesting, which we discovered, uh, my colleague actually, Ivan Chikula discovered. This is a picture of the first DC defibrillator from 1952 that was in all the Russian hospitals. And this happens to be an example which was in the Dietrich um, Medical History uh, Museum in, in Cleveland on the Case Western Reserve campus. It's just down the street from my hospital. And um, uh, this was bought by Robert Hostler. Hostler was a, uh, was, had worked with Claude Beck, was a protege of Claude Beck, and they'd written a lot about resuscitation. The Russians were interested. They invited him to Russia. They gave him this to take back and said, wanted to try it. Nobody was interested. Nobody was interested. The Russians know, you know. Uh, by the way, there was something parallel in this you may know about the, the thrombolytic agents, too. The Russians were way ahead of us on that. In any event, the next person was a fellow named Peleshka from Prague, Czechoslovakia. In 1957, he reported on both direct and transthoracic use of DC shock for defibrillation purposes. He constructed his own DC defibrillator, modifying Gurevich's device by including an iron core in the inductor, and is credited with Improving the procedure of cardioversion by using lower voltage and, de and describing the effects of DC shock. In some, the work on DC current cardioversion and defibrillation and biphasic defibrillation waveforms first originated and was, first was developed in the East. Then in 1959, Vishnevsky and Sukerman were first to use DC cardioversion of atrial fibrillation during open heart surgery. And the patient had AF for three years, and the restoration of normal sinus rhythm took place during a mitral valve operation. In 1960, they reported 20 cases. They were the first reported transthoracic DC cardioversion of atrial arrhythmias. Uh, and they thought they were going to, Vishnevsky and Sukerman actually thought they were going to win the Nobel Prize, but it um, didn't happen. And um, this was, uh, again, two years before Laun reported anything. What about work in the Western world? Paul Zoll uh, at Beth Israel Hospital in, in Boston, Harvard Medical School. Uh, he, in 1956, he did the first transthoracic defibrillation in humans using AC current. It had been done in animals, as we talked about. Um, and then um, this is another very interesting story and in the character of people. I bet none of you, except the real pacemaker uh, experts and mavens, we would say. Zucuto, um, uh, was a, um, a Frenchman. Actually, he was born in Berlin in 1924, and when Hitler came along, his family moved to France. The Nazis followed him, and uh, he was remarkable. Uh, he escaped the Nazis in some terror. There's some famous stories about what happened and how he tried to cross. He had studied in Switzerland, had family in Switzerland, was trying to get to Switzerland, was turned back by the back to France, but he survived the war, and um, it was a, he was an engineer, and he was a physician, and uh, he made it's called the Block Reanimateur in 1953. It was the first automatic external pacemaker defibrillator. Remarkable. He, he actually patented it and sold um, um, over, I think it was 76 of them in France, Germany, and, and uh, Switzerland uh, later. When, uh, but he was able, it was able to sense a slow pulse, uh, able to sense a slow pulse from uh, in device attached to the to an ear or to a finger and provide uh, transcutaneous transven until the spontaneous rhythm of the heart uh, uh, occurred. At the same time, it could detect VF from an electrocardiogram and deliver an AC shock of, of adjustable voltage and duration with the ability to redirect uh, 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 VF and deliver a shock it, if needed. It was first uh, successfully used, I think it was 1969. See that bottom number, but I'm pretty sure that. Okay. Anyway, now we come to another very, very key person. This is Baru Berkovitz, and he is the reason 
that Laun was able to do what he did. Baruch Berkowitz, as I said, um, he, he had come to the United States, was working for American Optical Company, where he was in charge of their cardiac research. And at that time, uh, Laun was doing some, some work uh, in the public hospital at, at Harvard, and, uh, and they were using an oximeter, which wasn't working right. And so it was an American optical oximeter, so Baruch Berkowitz uh, was asked to, to come and fix it. But uh, uh, well, let me just read what it says about Berkowitz to set the stage. So he was born in Prague, Czechoslovakia, act, uh, educated in Charles University, immigrated to Israel in 49, and then 56 to the States, became senior engineer for the Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute. In 59, he joined American Optical. Uh, as Director of Cardiovascular Research, a post which he held until 1975 when he joined Medtronic. He remained there for, until his retirement. So what happens is, and uh, you can't read these letters, but Berkowitz knew of the work of, of uh, both Berkowitz and Pelishka, and he thought he could make this into something that was even more practical and that could be applied and was working on it. And when he came to uh, the laboratory of Laun, Laun had had an episode where, and I'll show, I'll show you that in a moment, he, he had gotten involved with one of his patients who had VT, and the, he, when the patient came to the hospital, they would give him IV enamide or quinidine, and they cardioverted him, but on this occasion, they couldn't do it. So um, Laun um, went to, uh, and the VT had never been shocked, by, uh, and, but uh, he went and, and got the, um, the, uh, uh, Oh, let me just go back here. For a minute. He got yeah, got Zoll. He got Zoll's. Um, Zoll was not in town, but he got Zoll's defibrillator, and he didn't know what he, he he took the risk of shocking. When the hospital found out about it, they tried to prevent him from doing it. He took full responsibility. It was a whole big situation there that was difficult. And to Lounge credit, he shocked him, and it was successful. So, but he 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 did not stay interested in this. Situation. And the work he was doing had nothing to do with ventricular fibrillation. But when Berkowitz came by, uh, he uh, suggested to, to Laun that he might be interested in this device. He was, he was looking for a laboratory to work with where he could test this on animals. And Laun was doing studies then where he was occluding the coronary artery of dogs acutely. And of course, they had a lot of ventricular fibrillation, and they were losing a lot of animals. And these are the letters, one from Sidney Alexander on, on the left and the other from Laun, saying how we didn't know anything about this, but we really want to work with you. And so what, ha what followed was they did these series on the dogs, and Berkowitz kept improving the capacitor and things. But when... Uh, when the paper finally got published, on the, on the, gave, on the first patient they were studied, there was no Berkowitz mentioned whatsoever. Um, so, that, so we get to Laun. And, uh, noting the previous work, so, and Laun didn't know anything about Gurevich, he didn't know anything about Pelishka, but, but it's quoted once in his paper, and in his first paper, and never again. Uh, noting uh, the previous work with DC defibrillation in humans by Gurevich in the Soviet Union and Pelishka in Czechoslovakia, as the adverse effects of AC shock. In 1962, Laun reported their success in terminating v single DC monomorphic shock in nine patients. He subsequently went on to expand DC cardioversion to successfully convert both atrial and ventricular arrhythmias using a, a monophasic DC shock. That same phase of that thing that had been, uh, Gurevich had described so much earlier. And then he, Laun is credited in the Western world with initiating the modern era of cardioversion. He was the first in the West to combine defibrillation and cardioversion with portability and safety. He is also credited with coining the term cardioversion for delivery of synchronized shock during the arrhythmia other than VF. So the synchronization was also Berkowitz. In fact, Berkowitz patented the, the, the defibrillator, the DC defibrillator for American Optical, and Berkowitz introduced uh, Synchronization, because and you, all the synchronization you see in pacemakers these days was all bits, and that was a key to avoid the vulnerable period the, the, and giving a shock. The Russians knew about the vulnerable period, but they said, "Ah, you make ventricular fibrillation, shock them again, then you'll have normal rhythm." They weren't worried about synchronization, but uh, uh, Laun, Laun understood this, and uh, again, no credit for Berkowitz whatsoever. So. Then, uh, so here we are then to say, we started with Volpian, we went to Jean-Louis Prevost, and Batelli, then to Lena Stern, 
then to Gurevich, then to Baru Berkovitz. Without him, there would have been no Laun. Without, and, um, and then we go to Laun. But if you look at what happened, really, if you, in 1939, the Russians had DC defibrillation, the East had it. Um, in 1952, it was uh, it was uh, in all their hospitals. But then, but the United States need to do some experimentation. But if you seven years later, the first DC uh, cardi version of a supraventricular arrhythmia occurred in Russia, uh, Tsukamin and uh, and his, and then in '62 we have the word the stuff from Laun. It took 1970. Uh, all the fibrillators with biphasic waveforms were in, in Russia, biphasic and all. And then if you look in 1998, the first biphasic defibrillator in the United States. And that happened only because the, um, the, the to make the implantable defibrillator, we're going to get to the moment, small enough, you, you needed to have a biphasic waveform. It was also very, very much better. So it took a long time to get to the United States, and you know, shamefully in many ways. Now, this is Frank Pantridge. I don't know how many of you know him. Another marvelous character in this story. Pantridge was a physician who shortly after he graduated in the UK was shipped off to Singapore, and a week later the Japanese captured Singapore, and he spent the rest of the war in a prison camp. Very much if you saw the movie Bridge on the River Kwai, that was him. Uh, that was, it wasn't that. The same camp, but the same thing. And when he was found, he... Um, he was described as interesting. He still had fire in his eyes, but he weighed a little over 60 pounds. But he was a determined person, and uh, he, did, he advanced the field enormously. So the ability to reverse death with a simple shock markedly improved in-hospital uh, in cardiac arrest uh, outcomes, yet the highest mortality was taking place many, mainly outside the hospital. And he made the first mobile coronary care unit began operation in 1966. It was a battery-operated portable defibrillator. And, um, I, and this is the time. Uh, that's a picture of it. Um, they called it the, uh, the Red Devil. Uh, aware, aware of the work of Pelishka, further improvements in the design of the defibrillator were made. A key stage in the development of the mobile intensive care unit team was the design of a portable defibrillator uh, using the uh, main, uh, miniature capacitor developed by the United States for the uh, national, uh, the NASA National Aeronautics Administration for the, for the space uh, exploration. Pantras, together with uh, John Anderson, who was a biomedical engineer, developed a 3.2 kilogram portable defibrillator that became available in 1971. The first device that they carried around, you know, weighed up 70 kilos, a remarkable difference. Um, and then, uh, with great passion, truly, Pan uh, Pantridge advocated his approach, making early defibrillation readily available everywhere. His ideas first became widely accepted in the United States, subsequently Anderson, together with Jennifer Agee, uh, who's still alive, by the way, and still spunky. Uh, another physician from Belfast uh, were among the first to develop the semi-automatic and automatic external defibrillators in the late 1970s and 1980s, and with continued development the portable defibrillator was gradually taken from the exclusive use of doctors and given to paramedics, then firemen, and finally to members of the public. And the benefits of this approach are more than obvious today. So then we get to the implantable defibrillator. And this is another, another remarkable story with a very, very remarkable person. And Lowen is in the middle of this too. And I'll let the history speak for itself. But this is Michel Morawski, who was born in 1925 in Warsaw, Poland. He was Mordechai Friedman at the time. And of course, when the Nazis came, uh, his family, he, he and, and a friend of his decided they were not going to hang around and wear the, the Jewish star and the like. And uh, what happened is he kept going east to avoid the Nazis. His family perished. He got as far, uh, as far uh, east as, uh, I can't read that now, but it's one of the stands. In any event, uh, I, uh, ad, uh, I guess it was Adji Adjinian. In any event, uh, he survived the war, went to medical school in Lyon, immigrated to Israel. And his mentor there was uh, a physician who had had a, my a micro infarction, had recurrent ventricular tachycardia, was treated with drugs. And, um, and uh, everyone knew that that would last forever. And sure enough, he died suddenly at home. And Morosky, who was really his, his, uh, his uh, surrogate father in so many ways, and he was devastated by this. And he vowed that there ought to be a way that you can 
treat these sort of things and acutely uh, uh, shock the person as long as they had the fibrillator implanted. And he set off on his path. To do this, he had to go to the States, and he, he came into the Hopkins Axis at Sinai in Baltimore, where he worked with uh, Morton Maurer. Uh, the two of them, um, this is a picture of them with the first prototype. And um, uh, so you all probably know the rest of the history, and I'll show you some of it. But interestingly enough, there was a fellow here in, uh, in Missouri, at the University of Missouri, named John Shooter. I don't know how many of you may even know him here, who in 1970, he was an electrical engineer, uh, biomedical engineering in Columbia, and was the first to implant and successfully use a cardiac defibrillator in a dog. I mean, I, we, we interviewed a lot of these people who were still alive, Yvonne and I, and, and Shooter actually said he was at an American Heart Association meeting just thinking about these things, and he decided that it should be possible to, um, to make something small enough and implant it, and he set out to do it. It was later abandoned, and I'll show you why Lown had a lot to do with that, and I'll, I'll show you in a moment. But, and this is it. When, uh, when Murawski reported his first uh, successful defibrillations of, of implanted device in dogs, uh, Lown wrote this famous editorial in circulation, and uh, it's too scary to read directly, but the basic line here, he said, is it's not like Mount Everest, you climb it because it's there. He said, you have to have a good reason for doing it, and he couldn't see any good reasons for following it. He, that Lown was so powerful at this time um, that the, uh, the NIH um, uh, turned down Murawski's uh, grants. Uh, John Shooter uh, heard from the NIH. He, he denies it because I asked him, but other people told me it's true that the NIH said that they wouldn't fund any grants if he was working on his defibrillator. So he went on to do other things which were very important in, in cardioversion, but not the defibrillator itself. And um, so uh, Medtronic, which had begun to support Murawski, withdrew their funds also. And he was out in the wilderness, and it took a while before they found someone who could work with them. But these are the series. This was the letter that, uh, that the editor that Lown had written. And there's some, uh, there's some uh, interesting responses to this. So this is Arthur Morse, who was a young whippersnapper at the time who had the gumption to, to take Lown on. Uh, but... Um, uh, this is Lau's response, and he was totally dismissive of Arthur Morse and remained uh, uh, totally dis dismissive. He, he remained more than just skeptical. He, he thought it was a terrible thing for Morosky to continue. So th this delayed the development of the, of the implantable defibrillator by at least a decade, it is thought. And a terrible story about Lau. And um, I, I don't want to just read this now, but it's the stories. And, and um, so... Laun, um, Laun gets credit for a lot of things, in, uh, and he did a lot of things. And the people who worked with Laun, we interviewed them all, almost all, in his laboratory. We interviewed Laun a couple of times. Laun totally forgot about those letters that he wrote to, 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 um, uh, to, to uh, Brew Berkowitz. Uh, and he also, uh, you may know, when, because he was the Nobel Prize for the Russian and was a physician against the war, uh, he visited Moscow 41 times, and I asked him, did you ever visit Gorbachev's laboratory? He said, no, I probably should have. Uh, and so uh, it's re remarkably sort of things. There, there are lots of people in here in, in these names who also played roles. Uh, not time enough to tell. If you, the, the, we wrote the article. It's a very nice article, I like to think, in uh, circulation, which is still available. Because it's copyrighted, I, I, I couldn't duplicate it here. But, uh, but anyway, so what, what I want to say is that this is a, to a talk about science, but not science. I think it's important because the history is remarkable. The characters who are in here, Murawski was very, very determined, and he, and he accomplished his feat despite a lot of handicap. Laun, uh, I, I have to be careful how I say it because he made many contributions but uh, I, I, a, lot of the, a lot of the things he did were not, were not very nice. That's a simple way to put it. And, um, and I, interesting, he told me himself, without my asking, when I, t I told him about the letters, it was interesting because I, I interviewed a guy named Amaris. Uh, he had one of the people who first worked with him, Amaris Singham, who was from Ceylon, uh, who went into the OR with the surgeons to do some cardioversions. And um, I had talked to Lown in the morning. Yvonne and I had talked to him on the phone in the morning. And I was going to call him back. Amari Singer, when I talked to him, 
I had already talked to Berkowitz, and Berkowitz had sent us these letters that showed that Laun didn't know anything about it, and that Laun said, yes, please let me have your device. I'll work with you. Tell me what to do. I'll develop it with you. And um, yet, you know, Laun, Laun, Laun didn't put his name on the paper. I think that I think that's itself. But, but Amara Singham, when he finished the phone call, said to me, I'm going to call Dr. Laun, let him know we talked. I said, sure, I'm going to talk to him later. And when I got, talked to Laun, the first thing I got on the phone, and he said, I hear you believe me. <laughs> and I said, no. I said, since I talked to you in the morning, I, I got these letters from uh, Baru Berkowitz. And he said, what letters? And I sent them to them. And he, he had forgotten them completely, conveniently, perhaps. I don't know. But, uh, but there, there's a lot of this. And again, the... Uh, the, the um, uh, the character of the people who, in pursuit of of good things, and not, not giving up, and um, and uh, achieving what, things that really advanced mankind, I think, speak for themselves. So I better stop. Thank you very much.